Okay, we should be live. Hi guys, happy Oceans Day. Welcome to another Exploring Oceans by the Seat of Your Pants Hangout. Today is all about uh, celebrating our oceans and bringing some of the world's leading scientists, explorers, and conservationists into classrooms to introduce the wonder of our oceans and why we need to protect them. My name is Elisa, and I'll be, your ho I'll be your host this morning. I'm very excited to introduce our explorer, Kenny Broad. Kenny was named National Geographic's Explorer of the Year in 2011 for his work in documenting the blue holes of the Bahamas. He combines physically demanding underwater cave exploration and environmental anthropology, and also works with complicated social problems ranging from climate change to inequity and in natural resource management. The need to study blue holes is urgent as they are among the least studied and most threatened habitats on Earth. So with that said, I'm going to let Kenny take it away. Hey, good morning, everyone. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. All right. School. You must be almost out of school. Give me a thumbs up if you're in your last week or two of school. All right. My son, we have. I'm down in Miami. We have two more days of school left till. I have an eight-year-old son, Lincoln, and a 12-year-old, Jasper. So they're... Oh, we got another Jasper in the class. We got Jasper in someone's class. Anyway, so it's Ocean's Day. Happy Ocean's Day, and we're all affected by the ocean. Doesn't even matter if we live all the way in the mountains, because whatever goes into our rivers and the mountains makes its way all the way down to the oceans, and the oceans control a lot of the the Earth's climate and our weather. So we all pretty much need to pay attention to the oceans. But I'm going to talk about a part of the oceans that's really kind of invisible, and it's out of sight, out of mind, and everyone talks about, oh, so much has been done in exploration, but you all have a whole lifetime ahead, and I'm going to show you a part of the world where we really haven't haven't spent any time exploring and barely touched the surface, which is really right under the surface. So I'm going to talk about, I'm going to say, the least explored part of our planet, and that's one of the reasons we don't understand it very well. But it's really important about for our drinking water, for crazy animals, so I'm going to try to take you there, and right now I'm going to start showing you a video, but let me just ask real quickly, how many of you have been in a cave? Any kind of oh, I see lots of hands going up. Oh, we got cavers, that's also called spelunkers. But this is how many of you have been in an underwater cave? Okay, good. I don't have any. I have job security. Well, this is what in. Oops. Let me see now. Okay. This is what an underwater cave looks like. Yep, pretty much pitch black, and. I took that photo, and I'm going to show you a bunch of cool photos, but they, um, they're they all done by my friend Wes Skiles, the photographer, and I'll talk about the photography. And this was from a National Geographic expedition. Kenny, we but can't that's see what, the screen yet. Oh, you can't, you can't see the screens? Not yet. Huh. Not now either? Let's see. Maybe. Let's try this. All right, how about anything come up? Yeah, we're good now. Okay, I can see you all again. Okay, and if you stop hearing me, because I'll keep talking forever, so if you stop hearing me, you, you interrupt, okay? Okay. All right, here we, let's try it again. So that is what an underwater cave looks like. Beautiful, huh? Now, if you go in without lights or without all the right equipment, that's all you're going to see is the darkest pitch ink black you've ever seen. And actually, I took that picture myself. But I'm going to show you a bunch of beautiful pictures, But and then I'll talk about the photographer, my friend Wes Skiles. But that's what a cave looks like. That's Wes down at 350 feet deep, and two of us dropping down into what's called a blue hole, and that's what they call them in the Bahamas, an underwater cave. And that's what it looks like on the surface. So you have blue holes in the middle of a pine forest, so that's fresh water, okay, right on the top because lighter fresh water sits on top of the salt water, and the salt water comes in from the ocean underground. So we think about the ocean and land disconnected, but they actually, near the coast, they're connected, and our, we get our drinking water that's sitting on top of the fresh water and what are called aquifers. Can you all still hear me?
Anyone there? You're good, Kenny. We can hear okay. you. Okay. okay, great. Well, that's what an ocean hole looks like. Okay, so that's the deepest known hole in the world, also in the Bahamas. That's 663 feet deep. So why is that thing out in the ocean? Well, if we go back to the light last ice age, so the peak of the last ice age was about 20,000 years ago. The water level was about 400 feet lower. So this used to be a dry cave, and the water would fall. It would eat away at the limestone, and then when the sea level would rise, the little bit of fresh water would be on top of the salt water, and that would also cause a chemical reaction that makes the caves go miles and miles underground. So you see the hole there, but when you get to the bottom of the hole, or even in the walls, you can start diving into the inland. And you might come up in a hole out in the ocean, but you might come up way far inland. Well, not all the holes are big and giant. Here you can see, you might recognize my bald head. Um, it's a high-tech probing device, but a lot of the holes, they may look beautiful and big, but they actually don't go anywhere. They've been filled in with mud and silt and trees, but then you can find tiny little holes, and they may go miles and miles. So, you know, exploration is sticking your head in sometimes, sticking your head in sometimes, sticking your head in a little further sometimes, and even further, and there's my good dive buddy in a great, great, great explorer, Brian Keiko, who's explored lots of the Bahamas caves. He's holding on to my foot. And when my mom sees this picture, she says to me, wait a second, you went to school for how many years to go do that? So just watch out. Going to school a lot can end you up in a, a little hole. But what you find in those holes is amazing. So I was sticking my head in a hole in the mangroves. So mangroves are plants that live on the coast, and that's where lots of the small ocean species live. So those are the roots of mangroves coming through peat. Peat is just another way to say a thick, thick mud that's been laid down over thousands of years. And so those are roots coming through 60 or 70 feet of peat, and there's Brian and I diving underneath it. So we're going from the ocean all the way to the inland. So we're kind of following the steps of the ocean to see what we see along the way. Sometimes we see sharks right at the entrance because you may have studied that sharks have to move to keep water going across their gills and they take the oxygen out of the water. There's dissolved oxygen in that water. Well, there's strong currents in some of the ocean caves, the ocean holes, so the sharks can just lay there peacefully. They don't have to use too much energy. You just kind of lift them up and move them over when you go start your dive and you say, excuse me, going on a dive. On your way back out, they might be in the way, and you just kind of say, excuse me, kind of lift them out of the way, and they never, never bother you. In fact, sharks are one of the, one of the species that we really need to protect because they're important for the marine ecosystem, so for all the life that lives in the ocean. So a lot of us think of sharks as scary, but they're really gentle, gentle creatures unless we really, really bother them. So once we get in there, sometimes it's really small, really tight cave, but sometimes it gets really big, so you open up, and there I'm swimming through the ice ages, right? I'm swimming up to where the sea level is hundreds of feet lower, and I'm coming up through a passageway. And you can see that yellow line. Well, like scuba diving, if you have a problem, you have the whole open surface on top of you. So you can slowly come up and deal with whatever you have to deal with. In a cave, you have to go out the same way, and it may be hours underwater, so you have to carry extra equipment, you carry backup lights, you always run a continuous guideline to the surface. You only use a little bit of your diving gas going in, a little bit coming out, and save a lot for emergencies. And you can see on my wrists, there's dive computers that tell me how deep I am, how long I've been down, and also tell me how fast I can come up, whether I have to stop at certain points on the way back up to make sure that the nitrogen that's in my diving gas gets out of my bloodstream. So there's all sorts of neat stuff that goes on in your body, the physiology, and then they're studying the chemistry of the water, the biology of what lives in there. And then, of course, the rocks themselves, the limestone, the geology, can tell us about the past. So I'll show you some of those creatures. But I want to just tell you, it's like flying, oops, wrong direction. It's like flying through inner space. And this is just a video now. Sometimes we use scooters. So this is a video that Jill Heinert, one of the great underwater explorers, who I think is going to be part of the Google Hangout today, 
that's a video that Jill shot when she and I went diving in Florida. So you can see it's almost like flying through outer space, but we're really in inner space. And this is all right beneath our feet. Sometimes there's roads going over these places. There's all sorts of buildings. So it's important to know what's underground because you don't want to build over a hole, especially if it's a dry hole, a dry cave. In a wet cave, the water supports a lot of the weight, the structural integrity of the cave, as the engineers would say it. But here we're driving a scooter and just flying through. And it feels, I can give you all sorts of reasons why it's important to study caves. But to tell you the truth, it just feels really cool flying through little, little pockets of water and rocks. And sometimes you get into giant rooms. I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but there's one, two, three, four divers there. And you can get a pull-out poster of this. National Geographic has it in the August 2010 issue of their magazine. But that's a picture that, that I always look at and I have it in my house. And you just can't imagine. You push through a tiny little hole and you end up in a room that's as big as like a baseball stadium where the Phillies play. And that's the person who took all the pictures. And when I was a teenager, he taught me how to cave dive. And really, he was my mentor, my teacher. And he never even, he just finished high school. And he learned all this stuff on his own. He learned about photography, diving. He invented equipment. He was really a hero in, in teaching us about our water resources. So one of the lessons, at least that I learned, was you don't have to go to school to learn all this stuff. You can learn it on your own. So whatever you love, it doesn't have to be diving. It can be watching birds. It can be drawing. Just, just do it. You can learn it yourself, especially now that you can get so much information off the Internet. So that's Wes Skiles, and he actually passed away right when the magazine came out on the newsstands in a diving accident. So part of exploration also has its dangerous side. Oops, sorry, traffic's loud. And remember, all these pictures you're seeing, it's hard enough to go in some of these places, but imagine doing it with a big camera and lights. So whenever you see pictures or a television show, imagine there's a whole film crew, and Wes was leading that film crew. And you can see how big the video cameras are that I'm carrying there. One of the problems with underwater caves is, like I said, that's where most of our drinking water is. And if we put garbage in them, because a lot of places don't have the right place to put garbage, so they'll throw them in the hole, but then the hole will fill up. So there I'm climbing over tons of garbage. Here I'm swimming over that garbage, and sometimes I'm swimming in these holes, and I'll see someone's uh, pipe that goes to a well, and that's their drinking water. So it's out of sight, out of mind, but we've got to remember that uh, most of our drinking water comes from under our feet. We think of rivers and lakes, but that's only a tiny, tiny bit of the water that's out there that's not already in ice. So if you think about it, if you take away the water that's in the poles, right, in the North and South Poles, and that's locked up in ice, more than 95% of our drinking water, of our fresh water supply, is beneath our feet. So we really got to think about what we put underground. You know, when we dig up places, that can affect our, our water, so different mining and fracking, and we all need energy, but we got to think about where we're getting it from and what it does to our, our drinking water. Even fun things like playing golf, when we put pesticides on the, on the grass to keep the bugs out or fertilizers, that can run off into our drinking water and then make its way out into the ocean. Because as I showed you, the ocean is connected to the inland holes. Even flushing uh, toilet, you know, if you have old medicines from when you were sick but you didn't use them, or even if you take a medicine because you're sick and it goes through your body, when you flush it down the toilet, it leaky pipes or when it gets cleaned they don't get all the chemicals out and that makes it out into the ocean so here's just a picture that shows all the different ways stuff we do makes it into our aquifer aquifer is another way to say our underground water reservoir so it could be from agriculture it could be from a leaky tanks and toilet tanks and could be a leaky gas tanks for where you fill up with gas so it's not that we're all doing it on purpose, but we just have to be really careful with what 
what ends up on the ground or what ends up in the rivers because that ends up in our drinking water and out in the ocean. Sometimes in these caves we find these really crazy microbes. So imagine if you were diving down at about 30 feet deep, you see this, this pink and white and green layers. Well, the, that's the color of the cells, the pigments in the microbes of billions and billions of bacteria. And you can actually smell it because it smells like rotten eggs, um, like sulfur, because it's hydrogen sulfide gas that's one of the byproducts of some of the bacteria. So it's actually kind of a poisonous layer, about 15 feet thick, that we go through. And it's poisonous to humans, so we go through it quickly. But to the microbes, they live off that. And some of the scientists, my friend Jennifer McAlady, who's an astrobiologist at Penn State University, she actually thinks that some of these microbes are very similar to the earliest forms of life on the Earth, three and a half billion years ago, or even to some of the life that might exist in, in outer space in Europa. So there's all sorts of reason to study these microbes. Except you got to be careful because if you spend too much time in there, that's what I used to look like before I used to dive in there. And now look at me now. I'm short and bald and I got a beard. So watch out in those places. There's other sorts of creatures and things that come from the ocean to the inland and the inland to the ocean. This is a whirlpool that we found in Grand Bahamas Island a long time ago. Look, that's a cave 70 feet deep. The fish can't even swim against it. The person can't swim against it. But look what happens when the tide switches. It's pulling water down 70 feet deep. That's a real whirlpool almost a quarter mile out in the ocean. And we were that's a non-toxic, so it's not poisonous. It was a dye we were using to study where the water goes. And you can see it how far it pulls down in there. And then I swim into it, which wasn't a smart idea. And I lost my camera and I had to pull myself out. Oop. And luckily I didn't panic. So always remember even if you're taking a test or if you're stressed out about something, always stop, try to relax yourself because you want to keep your, your breath down, your heart rate down, and that will keep your mind working. So I hate taking tests, so I always have to take a few, close my eyes and take a breath before tests. And here I was getting sucked in and I was holding my breath, so I had to pull myself out and just relax. You can see it pulling all that dye in. And that was a long time ago when I was really not, not thinking. But once you get in these beautiful caves, there's all sorts of neat science to do. So there's crustaceans. There's a Professor Tom Iliff in, in Texas A&M University who studies these extremophile forms of life. They don't have eyes. They live in pitch darkness, no oxygen. They're really amazing creatures that there's so much we don't know about them. In some of these caves, there's also fossils. So that's a crocodile that we found in the Bahamas. There's Brian holding it that we didn't even know existed. And all sorts of uh, paleontological finds of all different species that David Stedman from the Florida Museum of Natural History has found, along with Nancy Albury, who lives in the Bahamas and studies these creatures that we didn't even know existed in this part of the world. There's also ancient human remains. So for a long time, these islands were uninhabited, but there were Paleo-Indians that lived there at least uh, about 1,500 years ago. So there's so much archaeology and paleontology and physical anthropology to do in these places. It's amazing. And the other thing is we study the stalagmites. Those are those formations that you see coming up from the bottom. Tights come from the top, mites from, come from the bottom. But like tree rings or ice cores, we can take those back to the laboratory and we can use uh, geochemistry. So we do that here at the University of Miami with Peter Swart is the professor here who does it. And he does chemical analyses to figure out how old they are and then what the oxygen and the, the carbon isotopes were the ratio and that can tell us what the temperature was because remember these only form when the cave was dry when the water was dripping into the cave and then the water evaporates and leaves the minerals and this can tell us a lot about 
climate change. And we all know the difficulties with global warming and climate change and greenhouse gases. And we all use lots of machines, so we need we need to have energy. But how can we do it where it won't cause all the problems with climate? And we see that climate is very sensitive when we look at these stalagmites and go back in the past. It can change very, very quickly, which should really, all we need to remember is we better be very careful with our climate. And it's going to be your generation that that lives in the world that we're affecting now. So be sure to tell your parents keep track of their energy use and where it comes from. So let me show one more video before I sign off and we can ask some questions. So this is going through that poisonous hydrogen sulfide layer and we're taking a plastic bin because we're actually going to collect some fossils. And here we're just swimming through the drinking water. So this is actually in Florida where I live where almost all our drinking water comes from groundwater. And some of it, when we take samples, we have to go in narrow, narrow places where we keep our tanks on our side. We usually don't wear those full face masks, so uh, we were just trying them. They don't work too well in caves. But look, there's whole rivers underground. It's pushing sand. In, in, it's almost like the Amazon runs underneath our feet in Florida. And we're you know, pulling out a lot, a lot of that water for big agriculture and other uses, and it's slowing down. And when it slows down, you can have algae building up in it. So we, it's really a fragile ecosystem that we don't pay as much attention to because we don't see it every day like we do the rivers and the streams. And once you get through some of these tiny places, you end up in, in a whole other kind of room and beautiful, beautiful cave formations and you can find creatures that have been unchanged for 200 million years extremophile forms of life because they can live in these extreme conditions so it's extreme exploration to find extremely interesting things and there's Wes with his camera And we have all different types of people on our teams, from explorers to scientists to chemists to just friends who want to help out, citizen scientists. So there's all sorts of opportunities to get involved with science that I'm sure your teachers can help you out with. So I'm going to end. Here's just one picture. This is a picture of the Earth. And the blue marble is all the water we have. That represents all the water we have on the Earth. And the small marble is all the groundwater and streams. And that tiny, tiny, tiny little marble is just the surface water, the rivers and streams. So there's not much there at all. So anyway, that's the last slide. So I'll try to get back so we can ask some questions. That was awesome, Kenny. I think so, the deepest I've ever been in water was at the bottom of a 12-foot pool. So... All right. <laughs> so can you see me now or no? Now um, yes. Yep, we can okay. see you. Okay. Uh, do we have time well, for questions? Yeah, we absolutely have. We'll have time for one class to ask every question, or um, every class has one question. Okay, so we're going to start with Mrs. John's class. Um, they are grade 7 and 8 from Philadelphia. So Ms. John's class, you should be unmuted now. Can you guys say hey? Hello. Hey, gang. Okay. You guys can go ahead and ask your question for Kenny. Oh, can you, someone repeat it for me? I came a little faint. Um, how did you go from studying anthropology to exploring blue holes? Oh, good question. Well, anthropology actually has lots of different parts to it. And part of it is archaeology. Part of it is physical anthropology. I actually study living people like you and, and the people around us to see what we do with our environment. But I grew up in Miami Beach and when I started diving when I was 11 years old. So I always loved diving. And then once I learned there was science that you could do underwater, that helped me go back to school. So for a long time I just worked as a diver and I worked for a lot of scientists and I learned a lot but 
I wanted to run my own expedition, so I went back to study anthropology because I don't just like bones. I like the people who can talk. Okay, awesome. Now we're going to go to Mrs. Crumley's class. Um, so Ms. Crumley's class is grade 6 and 8 in uh, Virginia. So let's unmute them. Hi, Ms. Crumley's class. Hi. <laughs> All right. Okay, go ahead and ask your question, guys. Do you ever get scared when you go into the pool? Yeah, do I ever get scared? I get scared thinking about stuff, and so I don't do it. I try not to wait till it's too late. And if I start feeling nervous, I mean, I showed you pictures of going through really tight places, but I may have gone to that place five or six times, just went in a little bit, made sure I could come out. A little more next time, come back out. A little more next time, come back out. So you, you try not to do things that... Being a little bit nervous, a little scared is good because it keeps you aware and you don't want to you don't want to get uh, lazy in what you're doing. But I never do things that I'm scared or try to avoid things. I don't like being scared. I don't watch scary movies. I don't like bungee jumping. I like stuff that I feel like I have some control over. I have the exact same question for you. Okay, um, we're gonna go to Mrs. Kame's class from Ontario and they are grade four so you guys can go ahead and ask Kenny whatever All right. you want. Alright, good morning. Good morning. Hi. Hi. What's the deepest blue hole you've been in? So the deepest one I was ever in was that one I showed you that's 663 feet deep. So that's like over 200 meters. I don't know if you all are on meters or feet. But um, I haven't gone to the bottom of it, but we want to go to the bottom with it with a special suit that we wear. It's almost like a bubble. You can go all the way down and all the way up. So we're planning on going there hopefully this year. But I've been, I think, about 400 feet deep. So that's about the deepest I've ever gone diving. Okay. And finally, we are going to visit Mrs. Tate's class. Um, so they're grade one and two, and they are also from Canada. All right, Mrs. Tate's class. What kind of sharks do you have to move? Oh, that's a great question. Well, there's different kinds of sharks that we see in the Caribbean and in the Bahamas. So sometimes it's a nurse shark. Sometimes they call them sand tiger sharks. Um, the other kinds of sharks that we see in that area are bull sharks and hammerhead sharks and all different types. But the ones I've seen mostly sleeping in the caves are nurse sharks. But you can see all different types. And out in the ocean, there's black tip sharks and reef sharks and um, mako sharks out in the bluer ocean. So I love seeing sharks. And they've never, never bothered me. Oop, is it loud? I, I'm at an outdoor place, so I don't know if it's too loud for you all. <laughs> Someone <laughs> no, just sneezed no behind worries. me. Um, it's cool, Kenny. Before we leave, do you guys do you have any closing thoughts for the classrooms today, or um, have any ideas to get everyone inspired and excited about our oceans? Hey, all you have to do is follow what you like doing, and you'll find a path to do it. And it doesn't have to be taking chances, taking risk. It just has to be caring about something. And it could be caring about other people. It can be caring about caring about the environment. But as long as you're passionate about what you're doing and take care of each other, we'll all be in good shape. So I can't wait to go diving with you all one day. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kenny, and for the classrooms that joined us today and everyone that's watching. Um, keep an eye out for the rest of the day uh, for the rest of the World Oceans Day Hangouts. Um, and that's all the time we have. So thanks for tuning in. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye. Thank you.